When an animal dies, the nutrients that were locked up in their body are returned to the ecosystem. Microorganisms break down important nutrients, important building blocks for life like potassium and iron, into a usable form so they are given back to the ecosystem they were borrowed from. One of the key differences between the ecosystems of the ocean and those on dry land is that out of the water, when an animal dies, the body will start to decompose fairly close to where the animal died, and the nutrients are returned right back into the ecosystem. However, in the ocean, more often than not, when a marine animal dies, the body will just sink into the sea. Depending on where the animal met its end, this could just be a drop of a few meters or so into a coral reef or a kelp forest, or it could mean literally sinking into the abyss, traversing into another realm, the animal perhaps traveling further than it ever did while in life. So with inland ecosystems, it is taken for granted that at some point the nutrients will be returned to the environment. But this is not necessarily the case for an ecosystem in the sea. Because of this, the mechanisms of ocean currents like tides and thermal rising that swirl and slosh large bodies of water and nutrients around the world are crucial for marine life and are a fundamental part of how marine ecosystems function differently to on land. One way that nutrients from the deep can make their way nearer the surface is through climbing thermally and mixing with the upper layers. The problem is that in most of the ocean this doesn't happen very much. Because the sun heats up the surface, the sea temperature drops dramatically a few hundred meters down, and this difference in temperature is known as a thermocline. This creates a section of warm water at the surface, preventing the colder deep sea nutrients from rising. In temperate seas, this changes with the seasons, and more nutrients can mix in the winter. However, in tropical seas, the surface temperature can be so warm and unchanging throughout the year that there is an almost permanent barrier from nutrient mixing within the lower layers. This means that very much in contrast with land ecosystems, outside of coral reefs, equatorial waters are actually some of the least productive and least nutrient dense regions in the entire ocean. At the poles though, the surface temperature is often even lower than the deep sea. The average temperature of the deep sea is around 4 degrees, but at higher latitudes, the surface temperature can fall just below freezing. This allows for permanent mixing of the ocean layers, making the Earth's Arctic and Antarctic regions incredibly nutrient rich. Another way nutrients move is through a process known as overturning circulation, or thermohaline circulation, where sea currents travel in different directions depending on the depth. In the Atlantic, the surface water currents travel northward, bringing warm tropical water warming up Europe, and then in the Arctic, the high salinity and low temperatures force the water to sink. The deep water currents then travel southwards towards the southern ocean and Antarctica, so the Earth's ocean currents are like a giant conveyor belt that push massive volumes of water very slowly around the world. The complete journey from start to finish takes over a thousand years. The thermohaline circulation creates an additional way to feed the southern seas with nutrients from the deep, making the southern ocean around Antarctica the most nutrient-rich waters in the world. However, the one problem with all of this is that this part of the world is sorely lacking in another crucial ingredient for life, sunlight. And for a large chunk of the year, this part of the world is shadowed by permanent darkness, prohibiting photosynthesis, not taking advantage of the ocean's richness. However, in the summer, it is the complete opposite, and the poles are treated to the rays of 24-hour sunlight, and an astonishing spike in photosynthesis occurs in the summer months, making the Antarctic and Arctic some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet for a brief moment in time. About 80% of photosynthesis in the ocean is done by phytoplankton, which are microscopic photosynthesizers that are fed on by other small living things like copepods and krill. Krill are masters of living on incredibly small amounts of food. In the winter, when there isn't much food around, krill shrink in size and lose their secondary sexual characteristics, reverting back to a juvenile state to save energy. Under lab conditions, krill have been observed surviving up to 200 days without food. When the sun shines for the first time in months, a perfect storm of endless sunshine and a rich layer of nutrients feed the phytoplankton. Under this new abundance, the krill grow in size, regain sexual characteristics, and start to multiply. Because of the additional upwelling of nutrients around Antarctica and the size of the southern ocean, the krill blooms here are particularly massive, making Antarctic krill one of the most abundant species of animal in the world. Supported by the Antarctic summer abundance, Antarctic krill are much bigger than most other species of krill, growing to almost twice the size of the northern krill, which means more large animals in the southern hemisphere have adapted to feed on them. 
In the Northern Hemisphere, the only large animals that can feed on krill are baleen whales, that have adapted heavily to be able to do this. For other large animals, the only way they can benefit from the krill blooms in the summer months is by feeding on small fish and squid that feed on the krill or feed on predators of these smaller animals, gaining the energy from further up the food chain. However, around Antarctica, there are many large animals that feed directly on Antarctic krill, like fairly large species of fish, many species of penguins, and seals. Despite their name, crab eater seals do not eat crabs, and in fact 90% of their diet is Antarctic krill. Seals have quite unique teeth, where they are made up of multiple cusps, and this is one of the ways you can identify their skeletons. Crab eater seals have built on this design, and use these cusps to filter out the krill from the water. But even larger, leopard seals also feed on Antarctic krill as well. Leopard seals are big enough to hunt and eat large animals like penguins, and even juvenile crab eater seals. However, they also heavily consume Antarctic krill in the summer months. Because so many large animals can feed directly on the krill in the south, it makes a very efficient three-way food chain, where very little energy is lost, supporting an incredibly large amount of animals in one area. Another way that nutrients can be pulled up from the deep is through a process known as coastal upwelling. Wind blowing parallel with the coast combined with the Earth's rotation displaces surface coastal waters out to sea. The vacuum created by the movement pulls up cooler and more nutrient dense water from the deep. There are many coastal regions around the world that have predictable strong winds that churn and upwell the sea in intensifying nutrients. This is the force behind the strong marine mammal diversity on the west coast of North and South America, South Africa, India, Sri Lanka, and many other parts of the globe. These conditions that have created clusters of large krill swarms in certain areas of the globe have not actually been around for very long. Around 35 million years ago, Australia, Africa, and South America started to move north, creating the Southern Ocean that wraps around Antarctica and is responsible for the large modern sea currents. The strong winds that create high nutrient densities in places like Chile or California have only been around since the start of the Ice Age, around 3 to 5 million years ago, when global temperatures dropped. These recent changes have fundamentally changed the character of large marine animals in the sea. When it comes to prehistory, many animals have much larger relatives that used to live in the past, but when it comes to whales, it is actually the other way around, and baleen whales used to be much smaller. In fact, they have only reached the very large sizes they have today fairly recently. Around about 10 to 25 million years ago, the average size of a baleen whale was around 5 to 6 meters long. Which sounds big, but most ancient baleen whale skulls from this time can be picked up with two hands fairly easily. Today, 5 or 6 meters is the absolute minimum size of a modern whale species, and the average whale size is three times this, having skulls larger than cars. A lot of evidence shows that whales evolved into giants, most likely the largest animals that have ever lived, around 4 to 5 million years ago. Miniature baleen whales thrived in a time known as the Miocene that took place between 5 to 20 million years ago. They are often referred to as the Cetophys, although most scientists agree this isn't a strict family as many of these whales probably just looked very similar due to living in a similar way, rather than being closely related. It has even been suggested the pygmy right whale might also be a living member of the Cetotheridae that managed to survive, although again this is controversial. These smaller species of whales were also a lot more diverse than modern baleen whales, and their fossils seem to show they didn't travel as much. So there were many species of whales with many small ranges instead of the just 16 species of baleen whale that are all migratory in some way or another. However, usually they travel long distances across the globe following the patterns of food availability at different seasons. Study of the small prehistoric baleen whales show that they started to decline heavily around 5 million years ago, and the two families that house the giant whales that live today first started getting very big around 4 to 5 million years ago, which maps onto the changes in the ocean currents remarkably well, and some scientists believe these were the cause of whales becoming massive. Before these changes, a lot of plankton, krill, and small fish were more spread out across the oceans, but in a much lower density. This supported a very large population of small baleen whales. Once the oceans started changing to having seasonal and small but very nutrient-dense areas patchily distributed across the globe, it is thought it drove the smaller whales to extinction. It meant that there was an abundant buffet of whale food in certain parts of the world at certain times of the year, but a food desert of many miles in between 
and it is thought that larger filter feeding animals are much better suited to this environment. Once arriving at the rich feeding grounds, larger whales could use their significantly larger gulp to consume far more food, meaning they could go longer without eating again to travel the large distances of less food. So the modern ocean currents may have turned baleen whales into the largest animals that have ever existed, however more fossils need to be discovered to know for sure. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.